good day. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the third ASEAN Conference on Biodiversity's virtual session on business and biodiversity. To ensure the best possible experience for everyone, please take note of the following reminders. For those joining us through Zoom, kindly refer to the chat box found at the information from the organizers of today's event. Feel free to post in the chat box your name, designation, and the organization that you are representing. Beside the chat box is the Q&A box, where you can type in your questions for our speakers, which we will be reading out later during the virtual session. Please include your name and the organization, as well as to whom you are addressing the question to. During the Q&A section of our event, we will try to address as many questions as the time will allow. We request everyone to kindly keep their questions within the topic in focus. Please be reminded that this event is being recorded for documentation purposes. Additionally, we will be taking screenshots of the virtual session. For those watching through Facebook Live, please refer to the comments section for any announcement from our organizers. We encourage you to send in your messages and questions for the speakers or to the organizers using the comments section. Kindly include your name, designation, and the organization that you are representing along with your comment. For your questions, please remember to specify the speaker you are addressing the question to. Today's virtual session will be moderated by the head of the Ecology and Environment Department at DHI Water and Environment, Malaysia. She is a senior environmental consultant and environmental impact assessment practitioner with over 20 years of experience in natural resource management. Please welcome Ms. Tanya Golingi. Thank you. Good day, esteemed guests. And welcome to the third ASEAN Conference on Biodiversity, or ACB 2020's virtual session on business and biodiversity. I'm Tanya Golingi. I'm calling in from Kota Kinabalu, Sabah, Malaysia, and I'm honored to be uh, your moderator today. So today's event, jointly organized by Malaysia's Ministry of Energy and Natural Resources, or KETSA, and the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity, or ACB, is the fourth and final of the series of virtual sessions of the ACB 2020. So as you might know, the ACB 2020 was supposed to have been held in Kuala Lumpur in March this year, but had to be postponed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. But even a pandemic did not stop the ACB and KETSA from creating a venue to discuss the timely biodiversity issues that are important to the ASEAN region, such as the post-2020 uh, global Biodiversity Framework, second session on mainstreaming biodiversity, transformative change and in innovations in biodiversity conservation, and finally today's session on business and biodiversity. So with that, allow us to take you back to the highlights of the past three ACB 2020 virtual sessions with this video. Do we have the video? Not yet. Towards 2050, living in harmony with nature. This virtual dialogue kicked off in September to discuss the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. Dr. Naeem from Ketsa Malaysia opened the session by setting the intention of the dialogue as a platform for the ASEAN member states to engage with the CBD. 
Dr. Lim of the ACB highlighted action areas for the region, such as mainstreaming biodiversity, resource mobilization, communications, and integrating diverse perspectives. Ms. Mirema, Executive Secretary of CBD, pointed out main themes and issues of the post-2020 global resource mobilization, mainstreaming, cooperation and synergy, gender mainstreaming, clearinghouse mechanisms, protected and conserved areas, and the Cartagena Protocol on ensuring safety assessment on potential solutions. Mr. Haber provided the Zero Draft Overview, 2030 Milestones, as well as Targets, and further mentioned that trust is an important factor in driving transformative change. The ASEAN member state representatives made interventions on quantitative indicators in saving the genetic resources of species. The session concluded with Mr. Nguyen saying, We must ensure that action on biodiversity is part of our resilient and sustainable recovery efforts. What does mainstreaming of biodiversity across sectors mean for ASEAN? October's webinar started with a keynote address from Mr. Hillel from the CBD Secretariat on the long-term approach to mainstreaming. He outlined key action areas such as assessment, valuation, financial resources, and multi-stakeholder participation. Reactors included perspectives from Ms. Arida of the ACB discussing tools used in mainstreaming biodiversity in the ASEAN region. On agricultural innovation, Dr. Gregorio from CIRCA discussed the opportunities of combining agricultural productivity and biodiversity conservation. Mr. Navarra discussed the role of landscape architects in reintroducing natural areas in cities and advancing nature-based solutions. Malaysia's success stories mentioned its local actions such as supporting renewable energy and integrated river basin management, among others. The session concluded with ASEAN member states highlighting the need for a whole-of-nation approach on mainstreaming and how this platform can be used to learn from each other's success stories. How can transformative change be done to conserve biodiversity? The webinar in November started with Ms. Hernandez from IPBES, recognizing successful examples to follow and new patterns that lead to a sustainable future. Professor Ma discussed achieving transformative change through ecological civilization and how China is implementing ecological conservation redlining. Dr. Sasanti from Indonesia discussed the establishment of essential ecosystem areas and the use of citizen science as well as holistic approaches in research. Dr. Naim discussed the importance of green growth, legal and policy frameworks, and building ecological civilizations together. Dr. Naim discussed Malaysia's initiatives such as strengthening law and diversity protection and fortifying transboundary cooperation. The session concluded with Dr. Lim and Dr. Steyawati highlighting the importance of transformative change in regional cooperation and collaboration. How can businesses integrate sustainability measures to contribute to biodiversity conservation? For our fourth session, we look forward to seeing diverse perspectives on how businesses are integrating sustainable practices into its models and contributing to the overall aim of protecting biodiversity. As we reach the final leg of the ACB 2020 virtual sessions, we look forward to illustrating a picture of the region's inputs to the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework and other relevant initiatives in the run-up to CBD COP15 in China.
Great. Thank you for that video, Tofu Creatives. So we've heard of the saying that money doesn't grow on trees, and we all know what that line means. However, what if trees or biodiversity as a whole is actually what brings in the cash? So businesses rely on biodiversity in order to survive um, and thrive. The goods and services that support various businesses depend on biodiversity and ecosystem services. So to put it simply, biodiversity loss means bad news for businesses. The good thing is that more and more entrepreneurs and corporations are beginning to understand that profit is no longer the sole objective of a business. Sustainability is equally important. So our speakers today will provide guidance on how businesses can integrate sustainability measures and how it will contribute to biodiversity conservation. So let's get started, shall we? To officially open our event, let us welcome Malaysia's Minister of Energy and Natural Resources, his Excellency Dr. Shamsul Anwar Haji Nasara for his opening address. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera and a very good morning to all. His Excellency Mr. Kong Pok, Deputy Secretary General ASEAN Social Culture Community, ASEAN Secretariat. Dr. Tarisa Mundita Eslim, Executive Director, ASEAN Center for Biodiversity. Ms. Priyanka Brazil, Program Manager, Convention on Biological Diversity. Ladies and gentlemen, firstly, I am pleased to welcome all of you to the third ASEAN Conference for Biodiversity 2020, ACB 2020, visual session for which the team, business and biodiversity. We are fortunate to be able to hold this event via digital platform Due to the limitation brought by the COVID-19 pandemic. Two. While COVID-19 pandemic may have slowed us down, I believe all of us are doing our level best to respond to this difficult situation, especially dealing with the needs to adapt with the new normal. As we all know, ACB 2020 was scheduled for 16 to 20 March this year, has to be postponed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. For this reason, ACB 2020 has been modified to four visual sessions. I would like to express my appreciation for the support of all ASEAN states. I would also like to extend my gracious appreciation to the co-host ASEAN Center for Biodiversity in making this event possible. Ladies and gentlemen, it is undeniable that the ASEAN region is blessed with rich biodiversity in area less than half the size of Europe. We host over 54,000 recognized species across three distinct biogeographical regions Indochina, Sundaland, and Philippines. Such diversity has led to the recognition of three out of the 12 megadiverse countries in the world, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines. Recognizing our responsibility to work, protecting and sustainably managing such rich biodiversity. 
Malaysia has put in place various policy and law among which is the national policy on biodiversity 2060 to 2035. This policy aims to provide the framework for Malaysia to conserve our biodiversity and use it sustainably in the face of increasingly complex challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, the ASEAN Conference for Biodiversity 2020 is attended to provide a forum for a changing perspective on any said biodiversity issue in the region. It is also expected to chart transformative action that will affect the needed chain to conserve biodiversity and attain sustainable development in ASEAN. Output from ACB 2020 could also fit into regions position as the ASEAN member states for the 15th meeting of the conference of the parties to the Convention on Biodiversity to be half net year in China. The fourth ACB 2020 visual session today will be focusing on business and biodiversity. Biodiversity is a fundamental component for long-term survival of the business as they rely on each and every component of biodiversity throughout their supply chain. If in the past, most businesses had contributed to environmental degradation today, let us shift our horizon to support our environment through sustainable and environmentally friendly businesses. One of the important elements of managing biodiversity-based business venture is observing the carrying capacity requirement. Therefore, carrying capacity assessment is important in every ecosystem-based project as to ensure minimal impact on existing ecosystem. This will become one of the key criteria to work sustainable development where biodiversity and their habitat can be blended nicely into the development process. Therefore, we must constantly strive to ensure the conservation aspects of our forests and biodiversity are mainstream in the business sector. Businesses are also encouraged to support conservation program implemented by the government. In Malaysia, the Ministry of Energy and Natural Resources will implement the Greening Malaysia program through the 100 million tree planting campaign from 2021 to 2020 will involve participation of all parties including private companies, multinational cooperation, non-governmental organization, civil society organization, and communities to support and collaborate in these campaigns. Malaysia will also enforce the access to biological resources and benefit sharing Act 2017 on 18 December 2020 to regulate the use of biological resources addresses issue of bioprivacy 
and ensure that monetary and non-monetary benefit from the excess of biological resources are shared equitably, the Act will further strengthen the conservation and sustainable use of biological resources in Malaysia. Ladies and gentlemen, on the note, I hope this conference can further explore how businesses can together help achieve the conservation and sustainable development agenda in ASEAN. Once again, thank you for setting aside your valuable time for this session. And with this, I announce that the third ASEAN conference for Biodiversity 2020, Visual Session 4, with the theme Business and Biodiversity is now open. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, His Excellency Dato. Um, let us now hear from one of the ASEAN's leaders. Um, it's an honor to present the Deputy Secretary General of ASEAN for ASEAN Sociocultural Community, His Excellency Kung Fook. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Tanya. Uh, Yang Bermat Dato, Dr. Shamsul Anwar bin Haji Nasra, Minister of Energy and Natural Resources Malaysia, Dr. Teresa Mundita Lim, Executive Director of the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning. It is with great pleasure that I join all of you today at this fourth webinar session for the third ASEAN Conference on Biodiversity uh, 2020 on Business and Biodiversity. My sincerest appreciation goes to the Government of Malaysia and the ACP for the excellent arrangement for the convening of this virtual series. With its kickoff event in September 2020 on a CNCBD virtual dialogue on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, the four-part series have successfully brought the emerging uh, topics related to biodiversity conservation front and center, while discussing ways for ASEAN continuing inputs to the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. I'm encouraged by the active participation, deliberation with the previous ses uh, session, which highlighted mainstreaming biodiversity conservation in the planning and processes of various sectors and realizing that transformation needs to happen in the ASEAN region to achieve the 2050 vision for biodiversity. Therefore, I'm pleased to wrap this series with the discussions on concrete action on how businesses can integrate sustainability measures and how it will contribute to biodiversity conservation. As we know, business depends on natural capitals and biodiversity. Businesses depend heavily on biodiversity and ecosystem resources, the source of raw materials for industries such as agriculture, agribusiness, mining, pharmaceutical extractions, among others. The impacts on natural capital create both cost and benefit, not only for the businesses, but also for the society. Biodiversity loss ultimately leads to adverse effects on the business. Businesses play an important role in sustainable development and sustainable approaches to natural capital are vital as it is inherently scarce and its loss is often irreversible. The UN Decade on Biodiversity 2011-2020 had called to promote the benefits of adoption of biodiversity-friendly business practices to encourage uh, engagement with global business association and to create awareness raising campaigns that advocate the economic and business benefit of sustainable production and consumption. To this end, the ASEAN Working Group on Nature, Conservation and Biodiversity, supported by the ACB, has factored mainstreaming biodiversity into various sectors in its topmost agenda, as demonstrated by a series of biodiversity mainstreaming activities in agriculture, health, tourism, as well as climate change adaptation and mitigation, which have been put into action for the past few years. But our region is poised to lose 70 or 90 percent of habitats and 13 to 40, 42 percent of spaces by two, uh, 2100. 
this continued decline is threatening the ecosystem and its ability to provide a wide range of goods and services, which provide the foundation of our economies, livelihood, water, and food security, health, as well as quality of life. So how do we create a resilient economy that is resource efficient and protect natural resources, an economy that is further challenged by serious risk and impact of climate change and hardship caused by a pandemic? Uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as we close the year 2020, we know that COVID-19 pandemic has undoubtedly affected the lives and livelihood of our people. Beyond the human cost, the pandemic has taken a toll on the economy. It is estimated that global growth can shrink by up to 8% this year. In the ASEAN region, we are already experiencing a drastic economic slowdown. Key sectors have been affected, in particular travel and tourism, and the associated industry and other retail and service industry. With the ceasing of business operation resulting from quarantine measure, we see supply chain disrupted, employment and livelihood put at risk, and consumer confidence in decline. COVID-19 pandemic also compounded existing threat to the environment with all the resources currently focused on COVID-19 response, thus limiting enforcement availability and response, which could lead to, for example, increase of illegal forest activities. For this reason, the COVID-19 pandemic and its recovery should be seen as an opportunity to re-examine our relationship and opportunity to the natural world, to explore ways and initiatives toward a more collective and coordinated measure to promote the business of biodiversity in the region. On this, let me briefly share a few points. First, mainstreaming biodiversity into all aspects of development. The ASEAN joint statement to CBD COP14 called to accelerate action responding to the challenges to mainstream biodiversity consideration into relevant national plan sectors such as agriculture, fishery, tourism, health, mining, energy, infrastructure, uh, manu manufacturing, processing, and education, and also cross-sectoral issues such as climate change and call upon parties to the CBD, uh, other governments and organizations to share their experiences and practices to mainstream biodiversity. The CBD COP14 recognized the need for an enabling environment for mainstreaming biodiversity and an increased collaborative uh, ambition to halt and revert biodiversity loss through the con contribution of the business sector. And with the post-2020 global biodiversity framework anticipated to take off in 2021, much mobilization is anticipated from the private sector in halting biodiversity loss. Second, environmental value must be internalized within costs and natural capitals accounted for, accounted for. We should be able to measure value, report our natural capital. We need to put in place policies that will enhance knowledge sharing and promote the investment in natural capitals. Governments should enable condition by setting regulation and directing a sustainable economy through the creation of market incentive, which can stimulate the integration of natural capitals into market consideration and decision. Third, with pandemic uh, recovery in mind, there's a need to ensure that the public and private sectors build back better together. How will ASEAN respond and see opportunity in these uh, challenges that have emerged? How could ASEAN step up uh, efforts to promote sustainable and socially responsible investment uh, policy making at national and regional levels. We need to acknowledge the close linkage between biodiversity and human health and look into promoting nature based solutions uh, to increase the region's resilience towards future pandemic. For instance, increase food security through sustainable agriculture or improve alternative employment in ASEAN countries through micro and uh, medium scale green enterprises such as renewable energy and organic agriculture. To rely the three points about, I would like to call for increased business accountability for nature and that all stakeholder conservation, policymakers, practitioner, researcher, uh, communities and ASEAN should do more to connect businesses with the post uh, 2020 global biodiversity framework and reconfigure the business role responsibility as well as the investment to reverse the biodiversity loss degradation and future risks in the region. Ladies and gentlemen, ASEAN under Vietnam's strong and able chairmanship have demonstrated its commitment to achieve the vision of a cohesive and responsive ASEAN in 2020 with the adoption of the ASEAN company.
for the socioeconomic effects of this pandemic while propelling the economic trajectory, but the real work ahead is to implement it. And ASEAN is steadfast as we look forward to 2021 with bold decision and action under the chairmanship of Brunei Jerusalem with the themes of we care, we prepare, and we prosper. I hope the session today will stimulate discussion on this important topic to pave the way forward in building partnership, promote the businesses of biodiversity, and consider alternative model for sustainable development and biodiversity conservation in the region. I wish the session a fruitful deliberation and outcome and looking forward to greater support and closer collaboration with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Excellency. So we have one last ASEAN uh, leader um, who would like to welcome us today. Let us hear from the Executive Director of the ASEAN Centre for Biodiversity, Dr. Teresa Mundita Lim. Thank you very much, uh, Tanya. His Excellency Dato Dr. Shamsul Anwar Bin Haj Nasara, Minister of Energy and Natural Resources, Malaysia. His Excellency Kong Fok, Deputy Secretary General for ASEAN Social Cultural Community, ASEAN Secretariat. Bianca Brazil from the Secretariat of the Convention of Biological Diversity, our distinguished panel of speakers, friends from the business sector, our esteemed panel of reactors, with the representatives of the ASEAN member states, partners, friends, and online viewers and participants. Good morning to each and every one of you. Thank you for joining us in the fourth and final virtual session of the third ASEAN Conference in Biodiversity of ACB 2020. First, allow me to express our gratitude to the Ministry of Energy and Natural Resources of Malaysia, or KEPSA, for being our co-host and partner for ACB 2020. Although the COVID-19 pandemic has impeded our initial plans and preparations, as emphasized earlier by our previous speakers, our close coordination and synergy allowed us to adapt to the given situation accordingly. After three successful virtual sessions since September, we have reached the final and last of the four webinars we are convening in the run-up to the face-to-face -face component of the conference next year. In the previous sessions, we discussed relevant subjects and exchanged valuable information and knowledge that will aid us in our post-2020 ambitions for biodiversity. Today, the focus of this fourth virtual session is another highly relevant and interesting topic, business and biodiversity. The link between business and biodiversity is unmistakable and can no longer be ignored. There is a growing recognition that the disasters such as typhoons, floodings, and disease outbreaks that result in massive economic damages are connected to biodiversity loss. We continue to reel from the COVID-19 pandemic, which is known to have originated from wildlife that may have been displaced from their natural habitats. COVID-19 has crippled the operations of businesses affected, the socioeconomic well-being of many people, and caused the economy to contract by 3.8% according to the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework. The current public health challenges of the climate crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic raise the urgency of conserving biodiversity and spur us to double our cross-sectoral and cross-pillar efforts. No longer should saving our species and ecosystem be the responsibility of the environment sector alone. Owing to the fact that we all rely on our rich biological resources for our basic needs and raw materials, biodiversity should be everyone's business. Ensuring the sustainable use of biodiversity, including investing in conservation projects and programs, in fact, make good long-term business sense. The business sector is an important ally as we forge our path to recovery from the various crises we face and build a better normal by sustainably managing the most important assets of our region, biodiversity. Mainstreaming biodiversity not only in the strategies and programs of our organizations, but also in the way businesses operate and utilize natural capital can help reduce and prevent severe impacts on the environment and on our people. Today, 
We will hear global and regional perspectives on business and biodiversity from the Convention on Biological Diversity and EREDD. We are also honored to have with us representatives from companies that take biodiversity into account in the way they do business. We are looking forward to hearing from the Energy Development Corporation about their native tree planting and regeneration programs. Siam Cement Group Holdings Biodiversity Commitment and Management Practices and Gen Gentra Garda Futuras Innovative Ideas in Developing Eco-Friendly Food Packaging. Their experiences will make case for the benefits of mainstreaming biodiversity, not only through corporate social responsibility programs, but more significantly in their business models. Finally, insights from Dr. Ben Shamaporn Watanong Chai from ONEP of Thailand, Mr. Peter Pogda from Stora Enso of Lao PBR, and Dr. Marian de los Angeles, a resource economist expert from the Philippines, will further deepen our understanding of the value of biodiversity to the business sector. Thank you very much and looking forward to a fruitful discussion ahead. Great, uh, thank you, Dr. Lin. In case you've just joined us today, let me welcome you again to the Business and Biodiversity session, the fourth and final event in the ACB 2020 series of virtual sessions. My name is Tanya Golingi from DHI Water Environment Malaysia. So we have just heard from His Excellency Dr. Dr. Shamsul, His Excellency Kung Pok, and Dr. Teresa Mundita Lim. Let us now look into business and biodiversity to, through two different viewpoints, the global and the regional. First up for the global perspective, we have the program manager for business engagement with the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity. She gained experience in business and biodiversity related issues by managing the communication strategy on the international expansion of the life certification and by leading the institutional relationship and strategic partnerships of the Boticario Group as the liaison person on public policies, biodiversity and sustainable development goals. Joining us from Montreal, let us welcome Ms. Bianca Brazil. Good morning, everyone. Um, let me share my screen. Can you see the screen? Yes, it's not in presenter view though. Yes. Okay, thank you. So good morning to all. Um, I would like to begin by thanking the Asian Center for Biodiversity for the invitation and the opportunity uh, and to also congratulate them for the leadership demonstrated by all the efforts in building such a comprehensive program, um, bringing together different stakeholders and discussing ways forward um, toward a more sustainable future for all. Uh, my name is Bianca and I am the program manager for business engagement with the Secretariat of the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, uh, just a quick snapshot, uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity, for those who are not familiar um, with what we do, um, it is a convention um, that was uh, created by 196 parties um, in 1992 during the Rio um, 92 conference. Uh, um, and the creation was, was um, a celebration um, of you know, all these countries brought together uh, to discuss themes um, revolving around what we call the biodiversity conventions. So uh, in 1992, the creation of the combat, uh, the, the Convention on Combat of Desertification, the Convention on Climate Change and the Convention on Biological Diversity um, uh, charted the path for the discussion on the, the real um, issues around uh, sustainability and biodiversity conservation. Uh, the three pillars of the CBD are the conservation of biological diversity, sustainable use of natural resources, and the access and benefit sharing. So uh, all of these uh, components are very, very relevant for businesses. And therefore, uh, we think, you know, these opportunities to engage with different uh, um, organizations and members from the business community, they are very, very welcome. Um, sorry. So why biodiversity matters? Um, 
basically a three quarters of the land and two thirds of the marine environment have been significantly altered by human actions, according to the IPBES report launched last year. Um, it is estimated that at least, uh, you know, more than half of the GDP um, is heavily dependent on ecosystem services. And all the economic activity depends on nature one way or another. Um, so, you know, all the, the services provided by nature, um, all the, the, the air regulation, water, air, everything is very much intertwined. Um, so if we carry on on a business as, as usual scenario, this degradation um, could represent an annual loss of at least $400 billion, according to, to some research. So we are losing nature. Um, you know, the IPBES um, warned that nature loss is accelerating at unprecedented rates. So it is estimated that at least a million species are, are at risk of extinction from human activities. And so much of the land service has been so much altered by human actions that has brought severe impacts for our livelihoods, um, economies, food security, health, quality um, of life worldwide. Nature loss is putting our economies at, his, at, at risk. And according to the um, World Economic Forum, um, there's so much that can be gained um, if we move to a, to a nature-based transition that could create trillions in business opportunities uh, for companies that are, you know, um, tuned in and um, start moving towards that kind of uh, greener economy. We must address the, the emergency now. Um, basically, the CBD is the, 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 the organization um, that is uh, pretty much in charge of the discussions around the biodiversity. And um, in, in 2021, it is expected that we manage to organize the COP15, um, which will be the most important biodiversity conference uh, and represents the unique opportunity for governments to agree on an ambitious post-2020 framework that will help set humanity on course for achieving the CBD's 2050 vision of uh, living in harmony with nature. What we are discussing now is a post-2020 framework, um, which is a new strategic framework to be adopted at COP15. Um, this will build and replace uh, the current strategic plan for biodiversity that um, was launched in tw uh, 2010. Um, so there was a decade for biodiversity, um, which included 20 time-bound and measurable targets uh, which were known as the IH biodiversity targets for protecting and conserving, uh, conserving natural systems. Despite several uh, commitments by parties and stakeholders, I am sad to report that none of the 20 IH biodiversity targets were actually achieved in full by the, the end of 2020, and only six of them were partially achieved. Um, this is due to the, you know, several, um, several, uh, situations like normally you know countries have their national uh, realities that they have to address but also we could have done more um, with the time that we had so um, it is now imperative that we start acting and acting fast because we have uh, it is estimated that we have the next decade to actually get back on track and and secure uh, a life that is more sustainable for everyone so the post-2020 framework must build on these les lessons to create a transformative framework that sets the world into the, par the path uh, to reversing nature loss. And why is it relevant for businesses? Um, well, the post-2020 framework will translate into actions, policies and regulations at national and regional levels that will have direct consequences on the operations of companies. The key elements um, of this agreement will have an impact on how companies operate and how they can transform this, their business models. The agreement has the potential to unlock new business opportunities and will help create a, a level playing field and stable operating environment for business globally. Business participation is essential to drive the agenda in a direction that is aligned with business expectations, experiences, and real, uh, realities. And it's um, expected that is ambitious enough to achieve the level of action that the biodiversity crisis demands for. 
So um, in terms of the role of business and finance sectors, um, basically CBD is trying to engage with different actors in different countries, in different regions, um, to invite businesses and the finance sector to play a fundamental role alongside governments and civil society into the implementation of the post-2020. Um, we can build a very ambitious uh, post-2020 uh, post framework, but if we don't have uh, different stakeholders involved in the process, we will be uh, we will not be, be successful. So uh, how um, this would take place? Pretty much by integrating values of biodiversity into the decision-making process across operations and portfolios. The greening of supply chains and portfolios across the board um, from planning, operations, R&D, um, customer relations, everything should be um, integrated and take biodiversity into account. Increasing funding for biodiversity protection and sustainable use and measuring and reporting on impact so that companies know exactly what are their gaps and how they can address those in order to, to, to you know, be on track. Um, how does the engagement look like um, with what CBG is, is trying to, to, to achieve? So we do have a program, the Business Engagement Program, and we work with national and regional initiatives through the Global Partnership for Business and Biodiversity. Currently, we have 22 national and regional established initiatives, um, and the main um, form of operation is through information sharing, best practices, tools and mechanisms, metrics, studies, publications, etc. We also liaise with business associations, coalitions, big NGOs, academia and government to promote sustainable practices. Uh, I'm happy to, happy to report that uh, the Asian Center for Biodiversity is one of our member uh, organizations representing the Asian region. Um, we also promote webinars, uh, regional workshops, development of communications materials, events and so forth. And we are now currently developing streams of work, um, uh, they are specific sector and thematic is specific. Um, we also are um, initiating a finance engagement program in which we are um, aiming at engaging with financial sector uh, uh, more broadly to make sure that even you know portfolios uh, and investment um, opportunities address biodiversity um, all in all. And um, it is very critical to engage the business community in the Asian region. I am very encouraged by the leadership shown here today, and I look forward to working with the Asian Center for Biodiversity and all the distinguished guests in, in the lead up to, for COP15 and beyond. Um, there are many entry points for business ha that have taken place already. Um, so we organized a number of consultations on vari various uh, topics on the post-2020. Um, there is an ongoing platform, the Action Agenda for Nature and People, um, in which there is a dedicated session for uh, the business. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure to finish in one minute, just a second. Um, there is a for formal process with the CBD throughout the preparatory meetings, technical and specific bodies, um, implementation bodies, and a dedicated group that will discuss the post-2020. And of course, through the Global par uh, Partnership on Business and Biodiversity. So the next steps uh, between now and COP15, um, there are the prepar preparatory meetings that should take place in the first quarter of 20. 2021. Um, we have some international events and processes that are ongoing that we'll build on, um, and one of them is the, the, the conference here, um, the ACB conference. Um, and in 2021, we'll have COP15, the Business and Biodiversity Forum, um, an Innovation Technology Expo, and the Business and Nature Hub. And all these are events designed to, to engage with the, 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 the business community at large. Um, in a nutshell, that was it. Thank you so much for the attention. I'm sorry I ran out on uh, 20 seconds. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you, Bianca, for that and providing the context for the discussions today. Uh, in particular, the entry points for businesses in the post-2020 uh, framework development. If you have any questions for Bianca and later for the other guest speakers, just a reminder to please put them in the Q&A box in Zoom or the comment section in our Facebook live stream so that we'll get back to them uh, during the Q&A segment later. So after hearing from Bianca on the global perspective on business and biodiversity, it's now time we hear from the viewpoint of the ASEAN as a region. Our speaker is a, an environmental economic, economist from Indonesia, working in the area of environmental finance. Currently, she is part of the Enhanced Regional EU ASEAN Dialogue Instrument, or EU, EU Ready project. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the founder and the director of the Dala Institute for Environment and Society, Dr. Aidi Halimanjaya. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, chair and moderator. Today, my presentation will provide the regional view on natural capital, which connects business, biodiversity, and people. I present on behalf of the eReady program that is the cooperation between ASEAN and EU on several environmental topics, including on natural capital. So the presentation today will consist of 10 recommendations for natural capital roadmap, including natural capital in COVID green recovery and seven proposed flagship programs under the roadmap. I will include some examples how business and companies engage in environmental activities under the seven flagship programs. So this, uh, the, the roadmap and flagship programs uh, that I will present were based on the study of the current state of natural capital in ASEAN titled Investing in Sustainable Natural Capital in ASEAN Status Report. It's finished in October 2020 and conducted since the end of 2019. We gather information from interviews, online pool, is survey during country visit to Indonesia, Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam. It's also involved telephone and face-to-face -face interviews, especially during the ASEAN Heritage Park Conference in Pakse and the introductory forum in Bangkok at the end of 2019. So from the study, we find that natural capital commonly refers to the stock of natural resources and ecosystem provides many benefits to the people and the economies of ASEAN. ASEAN is biologically and culturally diverse region on the planet, including its biodiversity from which businesses, people, governments benefit and rely for their economies. ASEAN's rich environmental management tradition is sustained by its people for centuries, but now more and more shared with large corporations and companies. ASEAN has progressed in some areas on natural capital management, but some key public and private decision makers in ASEAN pay limited attention to natural capital degradation and biodiversity loss, especially in the past two decades. Lastly, there is a need for a natural capital roadmap and platform for ASEAN to set a pathway for sustainable natural capital management. This roadmap could facilitate the development of three areas related to ASEAN. First, regional integration and natural capital standards. Second, trade agreements and treatment of natural capital. And third, attracting foreign direct investment and investment in natural capital. So the 10 recommendation under road, ASEAN roadmap for policy actions that uh, is proposed First is to recognize the value of sustainable natural capital investment, especially in promoting the livelihood and health for ASEAN people. Second is for the ASEAN member state and business to recognize and implement the rights of local people and communities to sustainably manage natural capital and be consulted and benefit from natural capital use and management. Third is to increase dialogue and evidence on the importance of sustainable natural capital. The fourth one is to explore knowledge sharing on natural capital accounting by government and business to influence economic decision-making and promote sustainable investment. The fifth is to, to use of standards and compliance for business to reduce risk from unsustainable natural capital extraction in supply chain. The sixth one is to carefully reform subsidies, including fossil fuel subsidies and coal, which cause unsustainable natural resource dis destruction. Seven, to work with business to provide more incentive and support for investment in sustainable natural products, such as organic agriculture, ecotourism, herbal products and medicine, and sustainable forest plantation. The eighth is to work with the finance industry, such as banks, stock exchange, insurers, and asset managers to pro promote sustainable natural capital investment and lending. The ninth is to strengthen natural capital agencies and consolidate them across governments. These are the, institutionals, uh, the, the government institutions that manage natural capital. 
10, to explore mainstreaming sustainable natural capital practices to other ASEAN works on trade, standards, and investment. So the red map will cover seven flagship programs on natural capital. The first uh, flagship program, it's so-called Health as ASEAN Health T Environment. With the COVID-19 pandemic, health is now a top priority in ASEAN. And air and water pollution is likely to continue to be a large cause of death in ASEAN compared to COVID-19. So for example, payment for ecosystem services to conserve water has been done by mineral water companies and can be promoted further. This is just one of the examples. Second, ASEAN climate resilience through inclusive nature-based solution, such as carbon sequestration through afforestation are emerging as important responses to climate change. Some companies have committed to protect the remaining forests in their concessions and manage them in partnership with communities through social forestry. Third, ASEAN Sustainable Forest Forestry. Since deforestation continues across ASEAN, despite many agri-processing companies pledging to move toward zero deforestation by 2020, this pledge needs some continuous independent monitoring. Fourth, ASEAN Sustainable Oceans. Given the importance of both fish production and fish consumption in ASEAN, improved management of ocean and water bodies is vital. Currently, there are two relevant initiatives that are also ongoing in partnership with private sector. First is the Coral Triangle Initiative and the Partnership in Environmental Management for Seas of East Asia. Another innovative approach is fishery certifications. The companies in tourism sector involved in these initiatives to promote them since they get the direct benefits from pr the protection. Fifth, ASEAN Rivers Management. Transboundary rivers pose a major challenge in ASEAN, where means for cooperation are secured, including with private companies, which use the river to channel recycled waste wastewater, such as in the Mekong River Commission, they can provide a useful vehicle for large regional cooperation. Six, greening ASEAN financial markets and private sector. ASEAN private sector is booming and interest in environmental management is growing. For example, banking sector has started with this closure initiative for their sustainable loan portfolio. Seventh, ASEAN proper conservation. Since ASEAN has already invested over 7% of its land in protected areas, there's an urgent need to both demonstrate and secure their potential contribution to pro poor. For the additional natural capital in COVID re green recovery, we consider there are a couple of items. First, increase ASEAN food security by improving sustainable agriculture to stabilize food prices. And second, dealing with improved employment in ASEAN member states through small and medium enterprise. Third, stop ASEAN illegal wildlife trade and support more sustainable food market. Fourth, as public funds dwindle, tourism dries up and pressure increase, there is a need to conserve ASEAN natural capital. Fifth, close COVID-19 accountable and inclusive supply chain in ASEAN. Sixth, decentralized ecosystem-based social protection to deliver post-COVID-19 recovery in ASEAN. Seven, provide post-COVID debt relief to ASEAN with debt for climate and natural and nature program swapped. Even before COVID-19, fears were growing over developing country debt, which has reached over 8 trillion in 2019. Eight, improve access to renewable energy in ASEAN. Ninth, increase resilience for small scale fisheries in ASEAN. And lastly, increase cross-sectorial coordination among natural capital and different sectors such as health, agriculture, infrastructure, and energy. These 10 recommendations and seven flagship programs can be validated and hosted in ASEAN Natural Capital Platform, which can provide virtu uh, as a form of a virtual platform with regular face-to-face -face meeting. It would serve as a multi-sectoral and multi-stakeholder coordination mechanism that facilitate future regional activities on natural capital. This, should, this can be driven by relevant government, private sector, and ASEAN stakeholder. So thank you very much. And uh, I will just return this to uh, the chair and moderator. 
Great. Thank you for that, Dr. Ivy. As biodiversity is the living component of natural capital stocks, so the hope is that viewing biodiversity through a natural capital lens can provide a clear business case for the protection of biodiversity. So that segues nicely to the second part of this session, where we'll hear from the private sector on their experiences in integrating business and biodiversity. So first, let us hear about the experiences of the leading renewable energy company in the Philippines and the largest integrated geothermal company in the world in integrating biodiversity into their operations. Let us welcome today the Assistant Vice President and Head of Corporate Social Responsibility of the Energy Development Corporation, Mr. Alan Basena. Thank you, Tanya. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes, loud and clear. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, we'd like to thank the ACB for uh, this opportunity to uh, present our biodiversity conservation program. So let me start with a quick introduction of the ECB. Uh, as mentioned, we are leading renewable energy fund in the Philippines, and we are uh, one of the largest producers of general energy in the world. So this is our renewable energy. Um, we have a uh, wind, solar, hydro, and geothermal energy. Uh, but the big part of our energy is geothermal uh, energy. So um, this accounts um, uh, for about uh, 1,135 megawatt of renewable energy. This is a uh, 60% the Philippines. Next slide. See this general process operates in harmony with nature. Um, our general operation relies on the system and at the same time we impact the system. So this slide shows our different geothermal uh, operation sites in the country, in the Philippines. So we have a uh, region in, um, in uh, the four provinces across the Philippines from Sun, Zayas, to the Nile. So um, the geothermal sea is a lot of forest and watersheds. The biggest thing in the world. You know? So on this side, uh, our framework is um, Buffer, no? uh, buffer is an acronym for biodiversity, uh, upland uh, community management, forest restoration, forest protection, um, development, and regulatory compliance. So, as you can see, uh, biodiversity conservation is the top list. By the way, uh, we want to do uh, sustainable development goals. Now, you can see at the bottom of this slide that we are contributing to uh, four, at least four, of the SDGs. So as, uh, as I mentioned, thermal uh, operation or geothermal energy depends on the ecosystem. And in turn, we uh, enhance the ecosystem to our different uh, environment programs. And one of them is by Next slide. EDC um, has uh, probably the most comprehensive biodiversity conservation and monitoring program. Um, it, is, it is composed of several modules. You know? uh, we are monitoring our uh, flora, uh, which are the trees and the plants. We are also monitoring fauna, which are the wild resources. And uh, we are also monitoring our freshwater organisms for the health of our systems. For flora, Sorry, Alan. Oh, thank you. Uh, we're just breaking up a little bit. So I think with the video off, it might help a bit. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So uh, for Flora, we um, set up a two hectare permanent uh, forest mo uh, monitoring and 
environment and natural resources, we have the adopt a wildlife species wherein we commit um, company resources to protect the habitat of the species. priority species. Um, uh, sorry, sorry, Alan, to interrupt. It's Tanya here. Uh, the audio is really bad. I believe you have some heavy rain or something in your area at the moment that might be affecting the internet. Um, unfortunately, yes, there are some uh, quite a rain here. So would you mind perhaps, perhaps we could just get uh, the other speakers on first and then um, get you in just reshuffle a bit so in, to allow time sure, hopefully sure. for the rain to pass. Yeah, I okay. can come back later. Yeah, sorry, sorry, for, that. sorry for interrupting, but it's just not getting better. <laughs> it's okay, okay. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll try again later. Okay, thank sorry. you, thank you. All right, so perhaps um, uh, Jutamat, if you can be ready. Um, yeah. Yes, great, so I'll introduce uh, Jutamad from the materials industry. Um, as an environmental engineer, our speaker is presently the environmental and corporate social, um, social responsibility consultant of the Concrete Product um, and Aggregate Company Limited. Uh, it's a subsidiary of the CM Cement Group or SCG. So without further delay, let's hear from Ms. Jutamad. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Jutama Jichun, Sustainable Development Consultant from Siam Cement Ho Group Holding from Thailand. It's such an honor to be invited for sharing SCG into getting business and biodiversity. Uh, to start with SCG introduction, we have Atomic since 1913, and we also are the largest and oldest cement and building material company in Thailand and Southeast Asia. We have three business units, which are chemicals, cement building materials, and packaging. We do care about diversity because the tension and higher expectation from external stakeholders and society, especially the young generation these days, uh, in other perspective, is a good sign for the future biodiversity. And we also aim to be a role model in biodiversity conservation. SCG set the biodiversity committee to conduct the policy and implement best practice. We have a commitment not to operate in explore, mine, do in higher biodiversity area. And we follow biodiversity management and mitigation hierarchy. Other than that, we work with biodiversity external expert to make sure that our biodiversity commitment and goal is achievable after our my culture. At the obvious name of the Yam Simen group, people can, can easily guess what we do, right? Uh, and as a representative of material industry for this section, I forgot on cement industry, where we have green mining and strong biodiversity management. To produce cement, we need limestone as a raw material. We have four quarries in every region of Thailand. May I ask, what's that quarry look like in your perception? No plant, no animal, and extremely, extremely rough, right? But SCG quarry looks like this. SCG working with biodiversity expert, uh, five professor from four different university in Thailand, joining us on consulting the best quality rehabilitation practice and biodiversity management plan. We relentlessly follow our policy, therefore we apply biodiversity mitigation hierarchy into our practice. You can see that we have activity that can follow avoidance, minimization, rehabilitation, offset, and additional conservation action. 
big avoidance. SCG applies semi-open cut mining technique, the hybrid between side hill cut and open pit. The operation only occur in the middle of the mining only and we leave the edge, the outside edge, no add buffer zone. Uh, we will consume resource around 50% from our concession and leave 50% at buffer zone. The perks are preserving ecosystem, biodiversity, and outer scenery. This is the loss outside the quarry. When people walking by or passing by, it's hard to tell that we are operating mining inside this mountain. The min the minimization. We reduce biodiversity impact by implement environmental management in every quarry process. The rehabilitation. After we work closely with biodiversity experts, we have realized that to recover the habitat loss is not only pan the certainty. Uh, ecosystem restoration is the concept and the key that we apply to. So in the flora and fauna planting uh, the local species in our rehabilitation area and providing the food, habitat, and water for animals in rehabilitation area is the general rehabilitation process in SCD. And we can categorize an important species and plan to preserve it following biodiversity management plan. As you can see, this is our rehabilitation journey. First, unknown planning. Second, land and soil preparation is not needed to make sure that certain animal can walk freely in the mountain and the plant can easily grow in the nutrient tree. Then the seed, uh, seed correcting. We have the site phenology, so we will know when and where to collect the seed in the buffer zone. Then we seedling at our plant nursery and we planting at the beginning of the raining season. We also get rid of the invasive species to let the local species go in our rehabilitation area and continue monitoring flora and fauna. We gain the satisfied result because of our arduous work on rehabilitation. You can see the huge difference between 2008 and 2020 in the same area of the rehabilitation. By now, we already plant almost 200,000 trees in 109 hectares. Carbon sequestration in the buffer zone is around 500,000 tons CO2 equivalent. We track the biodiversity result indicator on different periods of time. This is 13 year result. The Shannon index around 2.4. And this is 10 year result. Shannon index around 2.6. We also provide habitat food by planting the food in rehabilitation area and install corn for water for the animal. We set the camera trap at our pond and found that the animal actually came back at our uh, rehabilitation area. This our photo was taken at a long site, and this too also. All of the rehabilitation uh, know-how and knowledge we collect in this handbook and publish on SCG website for who interest. We follow international guidelines and implement in our queries to ensure that we are on the right track of biodiversity management. Uh, some of them are still on primary learning progress such as IUCN Biodiversity for Business and National Capital. Additional biodiversity enhancement action are run under conserving water from mountain to mighty river project. It's the project for Thai rural community and society outside SCG. Begin with the upstream, we install small shake dam of more 100,000 units to restore the watershed for it and dot for it develops to community for it for conservation purpose. We install silo pond in community, planting terrestrial forest, mangrove and seagrass, and install fish home in the southern of Thailand. 
the zero conservation, we work with Khao Phabat North community in Salaburi, Thailand, installing chick dam and pond in the mountain where the zero live. So zero, zero don't have to come down into the human habitat and easily get harm. Planting terrestrial, planting terrestrial forest by order was for biodiversity restoration in community. Planting mangrove and installing crab bank at Tang, Thailand. Planting sea guard at Ban Motanoi, Tang, Thailand also, where is the habitat of dugong. Dugong only is sea guard for the living only. We also install fish home around 800 units at Kong La Chau Mai, Trang, Thailand, in the southern of Thailand. The main purpose of this project is to increase the income of the local fishermen in the monsoon season. Due to the biodiversity survey, we found that over 50 species in fish home area. This is the wrap of SCG indicating business and biodiversity. Thank you. Great, thank you Jutamat for sharing the efforts of SCG. Um, it's a great example of what's possible. So our next speaker that will be sharing experiences of integrating biodiversity in business processes is from the food industry. Our speaker is also trained in various fields of science, including botany and molecular systematics. May I present the chairman of the board of PT Jintra Gada Futura, Dr. Tegu Triono. Uh, thank you, uh, Tanya. Um, thank you as well to ACB and all of the participants who allow me to um, talk about the small project that we have done in the border between South of Sumatra and Jambi in Indonesia. Uh, let me share uh, the slide. I think I believe now you can see um, the slide and hopefully quite clear. Uh, you can see it from your end. Um, I will start with Jendra Garda Futura is the name of a, a little micro, not just a micro business, but a little micro business where we utilizing biodiversity as a resources uh, for producing the food packaging. And um, the location is in the border between South of Sumatra and Jambi province in Indonesia. Our journey actually started from uh, Wakatobi National Park. This is one of the ASEAN Heritage Park. And when we were there, uh, the team, we can see in certain season, we can see how all of this uh, garbage uh, floating around following the current intercontinental current pattern. And uh, some of that has just stopped and, and reside in, in the Wakatobi area. So it's back in 2018, when then we think that we should combine our knowledge, which is incorporate design, uh, technology, and, and uh, social aspect uh, to provide solution for uh, the community um, through the development of sustainable uh, business. So J uh, JGF, um, uh, acronym for Gender Agarda Futura, not, uh, did not work in by themselves. We work with the ETB, one of the technological university in Bandung. We also have support from ZSL when we develop this business. And then also we work with the Indonesian Institute of Sciences in developing uh, alternative biomaterial. The approach that we are using is community-based innovation. Um, in addition to all of this uh, rubbish and garbage, you have seen in the picture, we are looking at the uh, number of the food container used uh, before COVID. There's uh, about 561 million food packaging used every month. And, and with the pandemic, people uh, trying to limit their uh, movement and order everything by uh, online. The increasing use of this packaging um, was up, moving up 47%. So you can imagine how the things getting uh, worse and worse. Some of those uh, package, uh, food packaging, you only use it for seven minutes, but they take more than 200 years to be able to uh, degrade it uh, properly. 
So we started the project by looking at the biodiversity component in, in the floor uh, vegetation in south of Sumatra and Jambi. And um, Arica catechu, the betel nut palm, is one of the uh, natural components of the uh, ecosystem, peatland ecosystem. And we work with the, the people, the community uh, cooperatives in one of the villages in South of Sumatra to utilize uh, the resources, which is abundant uh, in Jambi and South of Sumatra. So in Jambi itself, people also, other than just growing naturally, they also planted the Arica catechu, the beetle um, in about uh, 1,891 hectares. So you can imagine um, how many numbers of the three of the, the palm are growing in that area. And normally they can only harvest once a year the fruits and selling that in the market. So between that, they don't actually utilizing the, the palm and getting uh, or earn income from it. So this is uh, the, um, what uh, JGF tried to work with the people. So our product, one of our product is the food container in the middle. So um, we don't add anything uh, or any additional substrate to it. It's a purely a natural uh, biomass, which is we just been doing some design and processing to produce uh, uh, environmentally uh, food packaging. Um, the package degraded within 60 days or after people using it and they throw it away. It has been tested by other uh, independent CSO who tested that and within 20 days actually, um, the particle, the, the food container already uh, degraded into smaller particle. So using the model, we actually developed a resilient for local economies. So people who was only rely, were only rely the income from a natural uh, rubber, uh, from rubber plantation, now they have other income from utilizing the agricultural uh, waste uh, in terms of uh, metal nut leaf uh, seed, where they can produce a food container and selling that in the market. So it's combining lots of things like micro manufacturing, um, generate, generate uh, income for the people, and also um, improving the traditional cooperative into a more uh, modern cooperatives. This is the business model. Uh, it's quite simple, where um, JKF through the brand Plopa, so we have the, uh, the brand or the product, we um, assist the cooperative who produce that uh, food container and other uh, food utensils to actually uh, sell that in the market. Indeed, the uh, JGF will act at that position for limited time. Um, if then the people could work uh, by themselves and getting better uh, income, then um, the chain should be more efficient and more direct to the people. This is uh, the development of the micro manufacturing uh, from left to right. You can see how people utilizing the machine that we designed and we produce in, in Bandung, and then we set up in the village, and they use the uh, uh, palm leaf seed to produce the food container and other uh, food utensils like uh, um, plates and also bowl uh, for food. This is uh, the name of the brand and all of the supporters that uh, assist us in the development at the time. And we try to introduce uh, how um, manufacturing process can do can uh, can be done by the communities in the right way, uh, in the good way, and the safe way as well. Looking to the market, um, we don't want to blame to to um, the coming of the COVID nineteen. When the uh, JGF established in the uh, middle of two thousand and nineteen. It's just started when in uh, early 2020, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic was happened. But if we look into all of those uh, market for uh, uh, packaging industry, there is a attraction of uh, more than 30 million US dollar where, where people actually, the community could also um, take the benefit of that using the natural resources they have uh, in their local area. But 
if looking to the market, when you look into this circle and uh, see the uh, first quadrant of this, all of this uh, um, eco-friendly uh, packaging product normally has the price higher than if people keep using uh, the non-environmental friendly material. So things need to be done uh, at policy level as well as at the, at the a collaborative levels um, to be able to make it um, giving more uh, significant impact at the local, at the national, or even at Asia, ASEAN level uh, as well. I would like to close the talk, uh, the short talk, by showing you the poem by uh, Augustus de Morgan. So great fleas have little fleas up on their back to buy them, and little fleas have lesser fleas and so at infinitum. And the great fleas themselves in turn have greater fleas to go on, while these again have greater still and greater still and so on. So what J JGF and other, I believe, many, many others of similar startup uh, producing the green product in ASEAN or in the global, they only become alternative, but not a solution unless if there is a policy as um, I mentioned uh, previously, um, that support all of these efforts. The policy that combine these efforts and make them having a really greater impact than if they work on their own at the corner of ASEAN region. So with working together, uh, we can thinking that reducing pollution pressure to biodiversity as I show you in the first slide, that will be happen. And whatever the CBD goals um, and reaching, uh, reducing biodiversity loss, that should be or able to be supported by such sort of model that we develop in this uh, corner of Indonesia, in collaboration with all of those people, all of the startups, all of those micro businesses who did the same for the ASEAN. So I would like to close this by showing you um, the article of Nature published in 9 of December, 2020, that um, at global human-made human uh, biomass has exceeded all the living biomass. What, it, what does it mean? That everything we produce from non-natural uh, resources, now the amount is exceeding whatever we have from the biomass or natural things that we use previously until now. So again, if we're talking about the ESG and the business, how we could consider this such of the things that backs to all of us and back to, uh, it back to whatever the policy that uh, we have at the local level, at the national level, as well as at the uh, uh, Asian, ASEAN level or uh, at global level. Well, um, thank you and I'm returned to, to Tanya. Thank you, Dr. Tugu. Those uh, stats were indeed sobering, but it's exciting to see the possibilities for companies to integrate biodiversity in their business models. And I think this is also a really good example where um, a model that addresses both social and environmental aspects. Um, so thanks for that. And now we will uh, go back to Alan, Alan Barsena from the Energy Development Corporation. We hope that the connection is a bit better now and we can hear his talk. Yeah. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, do you hear me now? Yes, it's loud and clear. Excellent. Sorry, yeah, sorry about the, the glitch a while ago. I think it must have been the rain, no? But uh, let me try again. So um, I hope it's clear now. So thank you for uh, giving us this opportunity to address uh, our biodiversity conservation programs of the GDLT. So um, the EDC or the Energy Development Corporation is the largest um, renewable energy company in the Philippines, delivering a wealth 
Uh, sorry. We've, okay, sorry. we lost. You're back again. It, the, the audio was breaking up really badly, but now it seems to be okay. So maybe we'll just yeah. try a sure. little bit more. Sure. Yeah. Next okay. slide, please. Uh, I'll just. Um, okay. So uh, as mentioned, uh, our geothermal operation depends on the ecosystem, and in return, Unfortunately, we seem to have lost uh, EDC entirely. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Um, yes, now we can Sorry, hear you. My audio is yeah. breaking. Up. Okay. So next slide, please. Can we have the next slide? So um, we have the most comprehensive biodiversity conservation and monitoring program. You know? um, it is composed of three modules, you know, uh, the flora, the fauna, and the freshwater. Um, of course, the flora are the, the plants uh, and the trees, no? and fauna are the wildlife resources, and the freshwater are the freshwater organisms, no? uh, and also the river systems. For flora, we set up a two hectare permanent forest dynamic plot for the monitoring of the structure and condition of the forest. So this is like a sampling plot where we um, collect and monitor um, relevant uh, data on, on plants and trees. No? So we also do um, forest studies like forest succession and forest restoration studies that will help us implement our forest restoration program called the BINHI. No? BINHI is um, a forest restoration program and greening legacy of the EDC. And um, we implement this through our uh, partnership with communities and, uh, and local governments and local stakeholders. No? Under the BINHI program, we also rescue and propagate our most threatened uh, Philippine native trees. For fauna, we do the biodiversity monitoring system or the BMS. We also do the flagship uh, species monitoring and in partnership with the government, uh, particularly the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, we have the Adopt a Wildlife Species Program where we commit resources to protect the habitat of the, the wildlife species uh, as priority uh, flagship species. And, and last, uh, we have the biomonitoring of selected streams and rivers. Um, as you know, um, these freshwater organisms um, provide a good um, indicator of the health of our rivers and, of course, ecosystem. Next slide. So these are just some lessons learned from the biodiversity conservation and monitoring program that we have been implementing for the last um, 10 years. No? We um, learned that, uh, of course, diversity in plants lead to a more resilient ecosystem. This has been proven um, after the Yolanda Typhoon, no strong typhoon in the Philippines, where we found out that the remaining standing trees were the native ones. No? And um, the trees that got destroyed first 
were really the you know the the exotic you know so um of course diversity also in the tree compositions and plants um lead to more resilient um communities and less disturbance you know? and um it, it uh, mitigates the impact of uh, environmental disturbances um, we also learned that the plant diversity depends on several factors like elevation and weather condition. You know? And uh, again, native trees are the more resilient than the exotic ones. This is why in the Binhi program, we are consciously using uh, native trees um, to, um, to be used in our planting um, initiatives. And of course, uh, successful forest restorations follows the natural stages of forest succession. So we just don't plant um, anywhere and in, 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 in all condition. We, we do studies um, on the, the, the different um, um, condition of the, the soil and uh, the different stages of forest succession so that we can select the appropriate species uh, to use. Next slide. So um, this slide shows that uh, we cannot protect every wildlife resources in, in our area, but we can protect priority species. So therefore, we selected um, priority species per, uh, per site. Um, for example, in, in, um, in, in, the, in the Visayas and Negros operation, we selected the Philippine warty pig. In the Bicol uh, region uh, operation, we selected the golden crown flying fox as our flagship species. And of course, in, in, the, in Mindanao, in Mount Apo, we have the Apo minor bird, and of course, the iconic Philippine eagle uh, as our flagship species. And also the Visayan hornbill in, 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 uh, in uh, Leyte, in the Visayas region. So uh, this just um, tells us that uh, by selecting priority species, uh, what we call flagship species, and protecting them, we are assured of the protection of other species dependent uh, on this flagship species. Next slide. So again, uh, these are some of the lessons learned. So uh, protecting wildlife is, or, is also protecting their habitat. This is why we have um, forest protection um, programs as well. And birds are good indicators of changing forest conditions. And also our geothermal sites became a living laboratory for students. And of course, to scientists that would like to do scientific researches on biodiversity. Next slide. So uh, as mentioned, we also monitor our rivers and streams. No? And uh, these are uh, good indicators of the health of the ecosystem as well. Next slide. We also uh, produce different um, education materials as part of our um, um, improving or increasing awareness of biodiversity conservation. So in the, in the past uh, years, we have uh, pre, uh, published uh, books on the native trees. This is uh, the Binhi book. We also uh, published last year our wildlife treasures. This is our collection of uh, the flagship species that we are protecting no, in, in our geothermal sites. No. And next slide. So um, our biodiversity program will not be a, a success without the partnership and cooperation of uh, all sectors of society like government, uh, the academe and local communities. So we are partnering with um, the Philippines uh, Department of Environment and Natural Resources. We are also partnering with the UP um, University of the Philippines Institute of Biology for us to get uh, the best practices and uh, you know, um, uh, the regu appropriate regulations that we can use in uh, implementing our biodiversity programs. Next slide. Next slide, please. Can we, okay. So I think this is the last slide. Um, in EDC, uh, protecting and conserving biodiversity is not only strategic to our business, but it is part of our uh, business model. No? Um, it is not just a CSR or corporate social responsibility, 
but it is part of our regenerative mission. Uh, in EDC, uh, biodiversity conservation program is not actually a cost, but it's an investment. No? It is investing in a future generation. It is investing in the sustainability of our uh, geothermal steam. It is investing in the sustainability of the ecosystem. And of course, it is investing in the future generations that will eventually enjoy um, our biodiversity resources. So uh, the last slide, I think, just shows our um, social media platforms. You can um, check us out on Facebook and on LinkedIn. No? So uh, this is uh, at EDCPH and at EDCBINHI. No? Um, so you can check this out and uh, we can explore um, partnerships uh, with you no? if you are interested to be part of our biodiversity conservation program. So I think that's about it. Thank you so much for your uh, kind attention. Thank you very much, Alan. I'm really glad the connection improved um, towards the middle there because that was a really informative um, look into the activities of EDC uh, around biodiversity conservation and monitoring. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Yeah. So just a quick reminder to send in your questions for the speakers using the Q&A box. We have several already um, and comments in the Facebook section, um, section in live stream for Facebook. So again, specify to whom you're directing the question along with your name and organization, and we will respond to your questions during the Q&A segment happening in just a short while. Right, so as we have heard the first-hand experiences of the industry experts, let's now get the inputs from the ASEAN member states and the private sector. Our first reactor today is a senior environmental officer in the Biodiversity Management Division, who is involved in multiple supervisory and advisory committees relating to biodiversity and the environment in Thailand. Let us welcome from the Office of Natural Resources and Environmental Policy and Planning, Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment Thailand, Dr. Benchamakon Watanongcha. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank for the Malaysia for the adjust the conference, SCB conference that are uh, intend to be held in the beginning of this year. And the adjust to the virtual meeting, which is quite good. And the topic of this meeting is uh, very important to us as well, because uh, like uh, uh, not only the CBD COP that I mentioned that the uh, biodiversity mainstreaming is important to help the protected the biodiversity and also is involved with the normal people lifestyle because uh, like we also encourage the uh, speaker that uh, give the information that the uh, important information that uh, how they deal with the business which is uh, beneficial to the uh, the other as well and then can be the good practice and uh, uh, example for the uh, the others to to follow up for instance, we encourage the, the food container that is quite, a, the, is good and like an update and suitable for the lifestyle after the COVID. And we try to change the, the pattern, the lifestyle of the people to, for the consumer and change that one. In Thailand, we try to do so as well, but the, it's an important thing that is a, like, a, it's not quite expensive in this stage, but I think in the future it will be good. And I also encourage the SCG, the cement company that are involved and show the case that how they manage the after the mining the, by trying to uh, planting the native tea and bring back the fauna to bring back. But I also have uh, some concern about that. Uh, it will be good if uh, they have a monitoring that uh, they mentioned that Shim, the Kunjutama mentioned before that the uh, SDG have a monitoring process as well. And but I cannot see that uh, how the local people or the people nearby the area can be involved with that. So I thought just that it may be uh, good that uh, you, if the next chance that you have a uh, like involve the people local community to be uh, planting the tea as well. So. Um, in this state, uh, maybe I pass the floor to the next reactor. I, I talk to do, to you that at this time for first first round. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ben Chamapon. So next, uh, we have one of the founders of Burapa Agroforestry Company Limited, a Laos Swedish plantation and wood products manufacturing company. Since two thousand five. 
Um, he's managed Sora Enso's greenfield operations on state land concessions in Lao PDR. So may I present the Chief Operating Officer of Lao PDR's Sora Enso, uh, Mr. Peter Fogde. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to start to thank the organizers, the presenters for very interesting presentations, and of course, all the participants. Now, Stura Enso is a Swedish Finnish company, and the, um, it's a renewable materials company, uh, materials based on, on wood fibers. And uh, it's a global company, it's fairly big. We work in 35 countries. Commitment, commitment to uh, sustainability and biodiversity is very strong in the Stura Enso group. Now, the, um, I work in Laos, and in Laos, the Stura Enso operations are really small, but, but still uh, with very important aspects. Now here we, we also are very much committed to sustainability and, and uh, protection, promotion of biodiversity. And it takes the form of, we are planting, we are planting eucalyptus trees. And if you say, for well, some people, you can't mention eucalyptus trees and, and biodiversity in the same sentence, but, but we definitely can. Now, the way we try to practice this, or we do practice this, is we are limiting the size of our plantations to a maximum of about 200 hectare blocks. Uh, all plantations are on a landscape level in a mosaic pattern. Uh, we respect and protect wildlife corridors and we monitor them with camera traps. Uh, we have a consistent use of farmer-owned intercropping in the plantations, which means the farmers are growing all types of food between the trees. Uh, and we use biological rather than chemical mitigation of pests, meaning we, we, we make sure we have a diversity of clones, etc. So we, we reduce the risk of pests. So that was a short introduction of, of uh, uh, Sturan, so globally and, and in Laos. The, uh, I would like to come back to Dr. Tager's uh, flies because I think that's very important. Uh, I'm impressed by all the initiatives and, and programs that, that are planned or being undertaken. Um, to me though, the, what really makes a difference is if the, uh, uh, there is a consumer driven demand on companies performance when it comes to sustainability and biodiversity. Uh, if the consumers, all the small flies, they are the ones that can put the pressure uh, on the companies. It's very simple. I mean, if, the, if there is consumer awareness and the pressure uh, for, for sustainability and biodiversity, and we don't perform, then we can't sell and we have no business. It's very simple. You don't need to, for government promotion, put instead consumer driven demands on the companies and there will be a change. A good example on this is in the, in the forestry sector is the FSC and PEFC uh, certification. In Europe today, it's basically impossible to sell wood, any kind of wood products if you are not FSC or PEFC certified. It's not the same in Asia, absolutely not. Um, and I know last week I was in the field myself and I went through the FSC annual audit and they did not leave one stone unturned to make sure that we, we follow all the principles and criteria for sustainability and biodiversity in our operations. So again, I think we should work more on the consumers. We, the, the awareness about among European consumers on about environment packaging, etc. to me, and I might be wrong, is much, much stronger than with the consumers in, in, in Southeast Asia. So work on the consumers. Thank you. Great, thank you, Peter. Um, next, we have the co-founder, board member emeritus and senior advisor of the Resources, Environment and Economic Center for Studies, Inc. Currently, she serves as a key expert in resource economics and environmental valuation for the EU ASEAN project, Biodiversity Conservation and Management of Protected Areas in ASEAN. Let us welcome Dr. Marianne de Los Angeles. 
Thank you for your kind introduction. I will share my screen now. May I share already? It doesn't seem to be up yet. Not yet. Um, it says other participants are still sharing. <clears throat> Okay, do you see it? Yeah. So I, I um, applaud the organizers, ACB, for uh, the range of presentations uh, that, we're, uh, that we have discussed. And these are very encouraging and innovative developments that reflect important steps towards Vision 2050. Um, on the ASEAN Natural Capital Roadmap, uh, the 10 recommendations are significant, as are the seven flagship programs. I have some suggestions uh, that they need to be uh, discussed in the future uh, on the enhanced tools for monitoring practices and assessing impacts to it. Um, and these are where we need considerable improvements uh, CN-wide. The environmental impact system, which is what is used to assess private investments and public investments at the project level um, should move towards incorporating economic values of ecosystem services, as well as non-economic indicators of welfare of communities and ecosystem health. Then if you have multiple projects in the same area, or if you have a program, you need to do strategic environmental and social assessment. They need to continue to improve both the government, private company, local and international bodies practices. In either of the two, private or public, benchmarking is a serious sin of omission in many investments, making it difficult to measure changes through time and difficult to do referencing with respect to targets or operationalized objectives. We need to go beyond lofty goals. Private sector efforts at economically valuing natural capital complements government's national accounting of natural capital and ecosystem services. Examples of which are the dominant uh, partnerships of which are the UNSEA and the WAVES Global Partnership Program. Uh, these have evolved now to include biodiversity and ecosystem services with the help of IPTBES, among others. Where is ASEAN with respect to these? Only a few countries are participating in these global initiatives. These tools, when synergized, private accounting and government accounting are key to mainstreaming sustaining natural capital practices. The Global Natural Capital Coalitions evolved from the protocols of the early stage to the conduct of case studies at the present. We look forward to learning from these results. And Adi probably didn't have the time to expand on this. We uh, need the metrics uh, on business. For example, the bank started with equatorial principles. Now their lending processes include various safeguards. Experiences from the private sector with EDC, the early practitioner, demonstrated sustainable energy production uh, and also quintuple dividends, uh, which I enumerate here. It is really a pioneer in managing all forms of assets, natural, human, social, and man-made capital, all seen through the biodiversity lens. EDC has also been learning by doing, and that's very important. It took time to get things right they have been priority citing, they self-monitor, and they collaborate with independent groups. The Siam Cement Group Holdings is an exception rather than a rule, a very pleasant exception. Biodiversity hierarchy um, uh, listing is very important for their prioritization. So are their knowledges and practices uh, they have earned, which need to be scaled up. It is a clear example of using earnings from depletable resource extraction to invest 
in creating renewable natural capital that impacts on ecosystem services and biodiversity. Considerable metrics were presented, but we are missing metrics like how are the company's bottom lines enhanced? We need more quantitative indicators in terms of changes relative to reference numbers rather than only absolute numbers. For the food industry example, this shows uh, sustainable consumption and production uh, potential interplay, excuse me, interplay. And um, this could be scaled up through industry associations and big sister, small sister relationships. I'm again missing the metrics for the, comp for the company. So in sum, we, uh, we accept that these are good practices, but we need to show that investing in natural capital makes business sense. What are the rates of return, benefits to various stakeholders, market expansion, access to external funds. Um, you need this to, to argue uh, to company decision makers and shareholders that we are doing things right. After all, we can't manage what we are not measuring and we can't invest in what we don't value. Um, forward for ASEAN, there are a number of initiatives, but uh, they are not, of course, uh, ASEAN wide because of resource constraints. Uh, and I, I mentioned some of these, but what ACB could perhaps facilitate is the creation of community of learners and practitioners on these, including cross partnerships, sharing, and with other initiatives like Biofin, among others. Thank you for the opportunity to contribute. Thank you, Dr. Ann. So we have one final reaction from one of the ASEAN member states. May I call on from the host AMS of the ACB 2020, the Under Secretary of the Biodiversity Management Division, Ministry of Energy and Natural Resources, Malaysia, Dr. Kairul Naim Adam. Uh, thank you, Ms. Tanya. Uh, Naim here from uh, Ministry of Energy and uh, Natural Resources. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to uh, everyone. Uh, first and foremost, Malaysia would like to express our appreciation to the ACB for uh, jointly organize uh, this session. And thank you also to all for join, joining our first up to uh, fourth uh, series of uh, virtual webinar. Thank you to esteemed speakers for insightful presentations sharing your thoughts and interesting sustainable uh, business practices. Uh, indeed, as we uh, highlighted earlier, business must go beyond the profit. And as what we can see, uh, it is clearly indicated that uh, more and more businesses, uh, in particular in uh, our region, are committed towards uh, business, uh, towards uh, biodiversity conservation efforts. Uh, I would like to echo the minister's key point uh, in his opening remarks on the importance of shifting the horizons uh, of businesses through sustainable and environmental uh, friendly uh, practices. This is where the businesses need to play a crucial role to ensure the purpose of mainstream biodiversity across uh, all sectors, uh, be it uh, agriculture, um, uh, commodity, uh, manufacturing, etc. the mainstreaming effort uh, should not be uh, compromised. Business and uh, biodiversity simply cannot be without the other. For government, the business and private sectors uh, should not only be viewed as stakeholders, but government must uh, treat them as uh, partners that will further support the uh, initiative by the government. In this view, Malaysia would like to highlight uh, two initiatives related to business and biodiversity uh, here in Malaysia. For uh, your information, under the platform uh, Global Partnership for Business and Biodiversity or GPBB program, the Ministry of Energy and Natural Resources Malaysia is supporting the establishment of Malaysian platform for business uh, and biodiversity or MPBB to be led by uh, private sector themselves. Uh, in this regard, uh, thank you to the HI Water Environment for initiating uh, this initiative 
and MPBB is expected to act as a bridge for a stronger collaboration between businesses at national as well as uh, at global level. Other initiative is the uh, public-private sector partnership uh, in the context of protected area management in the habitat uh, Penang Hill and Sugut Island marine conservation area that have shown great uh, success. Numerous efforts have been undertaken by the governments in this region to conserve our uh, precious biodiversity. And Malaysia would like to encourage business and private sector in the region to support this endeavor. Thank you, Ms. Tania. Thank you, Dr. Naim, for your remarks. And thank you very much to Dr. Marianne, Peter, and Dr. Benjamin Porn as well. So we are now at the Q&A segment um, of our event. Uh, before that, though, we'll, we'd like to hear from uh, other ASEAN member states as everyone's participation is needed to ensure we succeed with the goals of the ASEAN. So if I may, before the, moving on to general Q&A, open the floor to other representatives of the ASEAN member states who wish to provide their reactions. Please just send us a message to the chat box so that we can acknowledge you. Um, Meanwhile, okay. Okay, I'll move on to the Q&A now then, uh, if I just scroll down. So one of the first questions that we had actually was um, how many countries in ASEAN have actually mainstreamed biodiversity? How many have embedded biodiversity as part of decision-making, for example, in deciding planning applications? Um, thank you, Terralyn, um, for this question via Zoom. So we've had some response in the chat box, um, and overall the responses are that, you know, they're in varying states of address uh, or, or incorporation in the various member states. But I would like to call upon the um, ASEAN Secretary, Dr. Vong Sok, to provide some more examples of um, this incorporation in some of the countries. Do we have, yeah. Yeah. Thank um, thank you very much, um, Tanya, for your uh, introduction. And, and it's a really interesting question come from uh, Terralyn, uh, just to cut in. I mean, while well, before I answer this question and give some example, may I, I would like to um, thank you all the speaker and participant and also uh, private sector that take part today uh, webinar in particularly convey my high appreciation to the government of Malaysia, uh, the Ministry of uh, Energy and Natural Resources and ACB for organizing this third ASEAN conference uh, on biodiversity 2020 from the series of webinars right now with the four. So on business and biodiversity. So um, to answer this question, I mean, um, you may have known that all ASEAN member states are the contracting party to the CBD convention, as well as all the associate the multi-environmental agreement. So it means that uh, AMS, all ASEAN member states follow and work closely with the ACB resolution decision and also recommendation. And uh, all the member states also take part every COP of the CBD. With this, I mean, this is the way I change and also learn what a new decision made. And with that, I think uh, after that sort of decision, uh, AMS come with a strong commitment and action along with all the support and particularly with ASEAN Center for Biodiversity and our ASEAN partner as well. So with that, I'm proud that uh, AMS having fully committed to CBD and action at various scale and sector in working collaborative with other actors, including international organization, CSO, local community, as well as private sector, as you may have known in the respective area of uh, ASEAN. I mean, why we need to consider a different way from this today webinar, because there's some degree of progress and achievement of mainstreaming of biodiversity in ASEAN member states. For example, in agriculture, the IPM program, and also the integrated farming practices, Agroforestry have been introduced in ASEAN region uh, quite some time. The community of forestry, where they have a way how to build the a sustainable practice of forestry and the livelihood of community and, and, and also for 
income generation, the fishery uh, community, tourism community, all of this have been uh, tried to um, work with the uh, concept of uh, biodiversity uh, mainstreaming. And also some of the country have already advanced the green procurement, urban biodiversity. It's another way to look at from the urban perspective, as well as uh, many other um, uh, uh, planning tool and decision making. I mean, in the in the integrated sort of assessment. I mean, this refer to your question about uh, what kind of uh, thing that have been integrated in the ASEAN member state. I mean, the member state have already. Uh, I mean, apply uh, the um, various planning and planning and decision making tool, such as a series of environmental assessment tool that have been already uh, established in the legal framework of all ASEAN member states. The environmental impact assessment, the strategy environmental assessment, or sustainability assessment. While the other also uh, look from right now from the green growth kind of perspective and green economy. However, a question remains with us, whether it is enough mainstreaming biodiversity, um, uh, mainstreaming biodiversity, or optimally have been tapped into, or uh, have uh, tapped into the sustainability business of biodiversity, sustainability growth, nature-based solution, or and all resilient, including the wildlife zoonotic and pandemic, such as uh, the situ situation happened right now with the COVID-19. So I just would like to give you a short today webinar. It's a really important anchor as emphasized by uh, the Deputy Secretary of ASEAN this morning, call for all of us to reflect more, connect more, and create more opportunity for sustainability business of the biodiversity, including public and particular actor, for example, the SME and business actor. So this is another way for us to look at for advanced further mainstreaming biodiversity as part of the business of biodiversity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vong Sok, for that um, response. Um, I think there were a few other questions also addressed to, for example, uh, Jutamad about, you know, are these the, the practices that they shared, the, the mitigation measures were they required or not and yes they you know are required by the EIS but it's uh, again showing that people are the businesses are taking the step the next step as well so that yeah. kind of ties into uh, it's a partnership between the policymakers and the requirements of the country and and the, the companies themselves um, I'll just move on to the next question that I have here and uh, this is addressed to Dr. Idi from uh, Ramesh, IUCN SSPSG Regional Vice Chair. Uh, it's a question on how can we ensure that the 10 recommendations get converted from theory into practice? Um, because many recommendations in the past have not unfortunately moved beyond paper agreements. Dr. Idi? Okay, Dr. Idi is seems to have stepped out. Can't see her at the moment. I'll just move on again to some of the unanswered questions. I think you'll see that some have been answered uh, in the chat box. We have uh, another one from um, Ramesh to any or all panelists for biodiversity offset. It's uh, shown as the last option in the mitigation hierarchy. Um, however, it's not uncommon for investors, leading agencies, and beneficiary governments to use biodiversity offset as a justification to approve mega development projects um, and at times even degazetting parts of established protected areas. Um, and so frequently, many are not able to meet the minimum no net loss requirement, um, but this is not to public knowledge. If, are there any comments from the um, panelists on the use of biodiversity offset? I guess this is more a question, I think, for the, the agencies uh, and the policy level. Uh, Alan, did you have anything to comment on this? Yeah, uh, I, I'll take a, I'll take a try, Tanya. No? Yeah. 
So uh, you're, you're familiar, of course, you're familiar with the biodiversity offset principle. But in, in the case of EBC, we haven't really been uh, using that as a, as a as an intervention because um, fortunately our impact is less than um, our negative impact no, is is uh, less than our uh, uh, positive impact. So in short, we're doing more to uh, to protect and preserve the ecosystem and the environment. And um, uh, we try to uh, avoid and even uh, we're into the avoidance and minimization at this stage. So we haven't really, uh, we, have, we haven't done uh, offsets yet, no. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Okay. I think that bell meant that we are just about out of time. Um, there are some specific questions, for example, to Dr. Tegu on some details on um, the products and, and setting up the, the um, industry, micro industry. So I think we will leave that for Dr. Tegu to respond to directly in the chat. Uh, perhaps we have time for just one last um, comment or question um, from uh, Christy Marie Nozawa to all panelists. I think this is an interesting one because the question is, what are the key challenges to mainstreaming biodiversity in businesses? So beyond words, what are actions reflecting uh, mainstreaming best practice in the private sector? So I'd like to again hear from um, one of the panelists from the business sector on this, the key challenges in mainstreaming. <clears throat> Could I call on um, perhaps Jutta Mad first? Hi. Hi. Can you <laughs> repeat the question again? Um, it's mainly on what what is the key challenge from say in your in your in, in, in SDC on what as the challenge to mainstream biodiversity in your business. So you've presented a lot of. Um, you know, activities that are done in, by your company, but what are those, the key challenges in incorporating this and even perhaps extending um, some, some um, biodiversity conservation practices? I think uh, the stakeholder, <coughs> sorry about that. I think the stakeholder knowledge about the biodiversity is an important uh, key and is it the main driving main driven and influence uh, the private sector to jump into the biodiversity mainstream because we, we also have the incentive for the stakeholder, especially our customer. Uh, and then we have to decide to do this or not. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jutta Matt. Unfortunately, uh, we've run out of time for other questions, but I think that really ties into what uh, Peter was saying earlier that, you know, uh, it's, we have, uh, we need awareness from the public sector because, uh, sorry, from the private individuals, the public, because if it's there, then they will be the ones driving demand. So thank you, Jutta Matt and all the speakers who've answered questions today. If there are any more um, uh, questions that were not addressed due to time constraints, our organizers will probably get in touch with you. Um, and uh, we just move on to closing now. So a lot of information has been shared in less than two hours today. To give us a quick recap of the key points of today's virtual session, I'd just like to turn you over to Desiree of Topu Creatives for a visual summary. Thank you, Tanya. So we started with opening remarks mentioning that biodiversity loss is bad news for businesses, how there's this call for a common responsibility, equitable sharing of benefits, increased business accountability, and how transformation needs to happen. And also how biodiversity should be everyone's business as this um, affects really all sectors. And then we heard from Ms. Bianca um, how none of the targets were unfortunately achieved, but we are setting the path for recovery in the role of businesses. Uh, they talked about engagement, integrating, greening the supply chain, and measuring and reporting impacts. And from eReady, we heard about um, the natural capital roadmap, strengthening agencies, decreasing fossil fuel subsidies, 
we heard about flagship programs and how on the road for the green COVID, green recovery for COVID, um, uh, stopping illegal wildlife trade and debt relief. And as from uh, EDC, from Mr. Barsena, we heard about uh, protecting priority species, protecting and enhancing the ecosystem, raising awareness, and how this is their regenerative mission. And from CM Cement, we uh, listened to uh, how this has also been, you know, pressure from the public, how they have been building a rehabilitation journey. And then from Indonesia, we heard about uh, this product um, and how the COVID has been uh, shifting our waste problem and how we use these things for seven minutes, but it lasts for 200 years and how uh, they have created this product, which can degrade in 60 days, and how it is possible to uh, have the right way, the good way, and the safe way. However, this is only an alternative, but not a solution. And from our reactions, we heard that uh, these products are uh, should be alternatively, sorry, it should be reasonably priced, and then the importance of consumer-driven demand, the need for more metrics, measurable goals. And then finally, from Dr. Naeem, how businesses must go beyond profit and how it's very important uh, to have the bridge building for all these partnerships. Thank you, everyone, for letting us draw the big picture with all of you. Great. Thank you for that great visual summary. Desiree, where we could see all the many examples where private sector have already taken on board the protection of biodiversity and integrated several practices into their business operations. So I think a key next step for the ASEAN region is to take advantage of this private sector's interest and foster a closer partnership between businesses and policymakers. We've heard the, uh, some panelists say that they need policy to push you know, incentives and that kind of thing. And perhaps, uh, again, back to Peter's remark that, you know, the 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 public needs to have the awareness to create the demand, and perhaps that's also an area where the policymakers can take take this up. But basically, to echo um, Dr. Nine's comments, um, businesses need to be actively engaged so as not to miss these opportunities to improve livelihoods and protect biodiversity, um, as we've seen through the examples today. So with that, um, for those who are interested in getting copies of the speakers' presentations, these will be available on the ATB 2020's website in due course. We have now reached the end of our event and the finale of the ATB 2020 series of virtual sessions. Thank you so much for spending a part of your day with us today. Please be sure to follow ACB's social media accounts to be updated on the latest activities of the ACB. So you can see the social media accounts for ACB flashed on your screens now. So this has been Tanya Golingi and on behalf of Ketsa Malaysia and the ACB, thank you and wishing you happy holidays in advance.